Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Joyner. Thank you for thinking of me. To get us started, could you tell me a little bit about your personal background and how you became interested in these topics to study? Sure. Um, where to begin? I, I grew up in Georgia, um, went to college up Northeast and, you know, even back then developed uh, just an interest in, and a fascination in questions having to do with human nature. Uh, that drew me to philosophy um, initially, but like a lot of, uh, I think, psychologists to be, philosophy frustrated me because it seemed like there was an endless argument and no arbitration. I wanted there to be answers. And, and psychology struck me as perfect for that, a, a perfect combination of um, the willingness to entertain pretty deep philosophical questions about human nature and at the same time be able to arbitrate those. Uh, get an answer to some of those questions. Uh, that really attracted me. And so, um, you know, probably for reasons of family history, as much as anything, suicidal behavior runs in my family. You know, that that aspect of human nature, the in my view, the misfiring of human nature. Also, the, the very profound misery that, that, that spurs suicidal behavior and the tragedy that it leaves behind those kinds of things, I, I've seen that in my family members firsthand. And so obviously I think that, you know, plays some role, but, um, but it also, you know, was just a, a genuine fascination and in the intellectual question of what does this mean about human nature? What can we learn from it uh, about human nature? And, and how can we understand this better, the phenomenon of suicidal behavior so that we can prevent misery and, and prevent tragedy? As a, a researcher, how do you approach such a, a personal topic while also trying to remain objective, or or is that not really a, a goal for you? I think it is a, a definite goal. Um, I think science is the way to, to solve this problem, just as it is for problems like cancer or heart disease. Um, and I, I don't really think it's a, a stretch to be very scientific about a question like cancer, and at the same time, very understanding and compassionate. Um, and that's exactly the approach that my group and I take. You know, we're determined scientists trying to unlock this mystery because we know that if we do, or if we make any progress at all, it'll contribute to, 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 to the human condition. Um, and to do that, we have to be dispassionate scientists in our view, but there's nothing about that that prevents us at the same time being very understanding and, and compassionate. Many people, many families are touched by this tragedy and, and I think compassion is only, is only proper. What are some of your favorite things about being a, a scientist and, and having a laboratory? It's the intellectual freedom and the intellectual adventure of it. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it I'm biased, you know, we're biased, but I, I suppose, but if you really reflect on the combination of, of freedom, fun, even um, intellectual adventure, the kinds of people, the kinds of ideas, um, also the, the status and, you know, the relatively speaking, the income of this walk of life, I, I, I think it has few, few rivals. Um, especially when you underline the, that, that part about freedom and intellectual adventure. I, I think th those are the, 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 the draws for me. And um, it, it's a career that I relish and that I, I really prize um, handing on to, to my students to follow, hopefully in my footsteps and well beyond. That would be a, a real pleasure for me to see. Well, and, and that leads actually quite nicely, I think, to my next question. Um, a lot of, of research on suicidal risk factors focuses on, on demographic variables. So gender, for example, or, or age, um, but you've taken a, a different kind of approach encompassing a more interpersonal um, sense of, of what factors people might face. Can you talk a little bit more about your decision to, to pursue that um, and, and what that means for you and your work? It really ties back around into my interest in human 
and fundamental questions of human nature. And, you know, most people who pondered that question are pretty quickly struck by the deeply social, you know, gregarious nature of our, of our species. Um, I'm also very struck by life's self-preservation mandate, not just humans, but creatures. And, and those two insights really have been the pillars of my own theorizing about suicidal behaviors that for someone to get into this very unique state of mind, uh, I mentioned earlier the misery associated with it, but there's also a, a really hard to grasp aspect of that state of mind that I think most people can't really grasp, and that's to the good, I'm glad they can't, but it makes it hard to reason about the suicidal mind. That's the challenge is a lot, a lot of times in our field, I think people have reasoned about the suicidal mind from a non-suicidal place. And I'm glad they're not suicidal, that's to the good, as I mentioned, but they tend to make mistakes in their reasoning because that's not where the mindset of the suicidal person is at all, totally different place. And so the insight, at least that I had was to be in that place, there must be some fundamental misfiring of basic human processes having to do with connection to others and also with the loss of this, this just compelling drive to, to survive, um, to preserve the self, to avoid pain, to avoid injury, to fear death. There must be really unique things going on in those two domains and, and Indeed, we've demonstrated so, I think, and, and have developed a theory on that basis. It's a theory with imperfections, to be sure, but it's also a theory with, um, with explanatory reach, I would, I would suggest. We're in the midst of a global pandemic where people are struggling with worries and, and concerns about their health, uh, financial stability, um, and, and so many other things. And, and of course, this impacts our ability to connect with others, uh, which, which, as you mentioned, is so important to the human condition. So based on your research and, and your experiences, from your perspective, what can we do to maintain those, those interpersonal connections um, when in, in some ways we are, are facing at least some degree of, of isolation now? Well, I mean, I do think we, we actually pondered this, this question in writing early on um, in a paper that came out in, in April um, in JAMA Psychiatry, pondered this very question. And basically what we arrived at is that there's reason for concern because anything that undermines social connection is a problem, you know, especially if it stresses people, worries people, undermines their finances, um, combined with the worry that people are buying more guns in the United States at any rate. That was true um, on all-time high in March and April, and it, the trend has continued, combined with people buying more alcohol. Um, it's a worrisome mixture. On the other hand, we pointed out that people tend to have a, a way of rallying together and figuring things out. And also, pandemics may have the effect of making people appreciate their lives or their health at any rate. And so those could be sort of anti-suicidal agents. So we predicted kind of a mix. And, and sure enough, I think that's what's happening is that overall, there's, a, there's been an understandable rise in stress, anxiety, worry, depression, things like that. Um, and, and yet some populations seem to be protected, almost like a port in a storm kind of effect where, for example, small town America, there's evidence that small town America is less affected by the stress and depression than, than more urban areas. We have evidence from our own psychotherapy clinic that, um, our patients actually, if anything, are doing better. With, with their suicide risk under pandemic. And we think it's just because we've been able, we've been very successful in maintaining connection to them, um, transitioning seamlessly, to much to my 
surprise actually, but this is what happened, tran transitioning seamlessly to telehealth. And, and we're their port in a storm, very reliable and, and, and um, you know, they can count on us. And, and so there's a, a bunch of findings like that that suggest to me that there are ports in the storm, but that there is a storm overall. Um, I don't know if that storm is going to translate over into, into suicide attempts and deaths. I certainly hope not. I, I do think it'll definitely translate over into suicidal thinking for, for people. But a lot of my work has been on the, the point that thinking does not necessarily translate over into behavior. Um, and and I, I don't know if this, if, if this will do it or not. I hope not. But that is a worry, and we'll see. We won't know those rates for many, many months. Um, you asked about factors that offset risk. In, in a pandemic. And I do think things like telehealth um, or Zoom, virtual interaction type things can have a role. Uh, I, social media can have a role uh, because it does have the effect of connecting people. I, I worry about it though a little bit because it's not, it's not the type of social connection that our species evolved under where it was very, very biological you know, in, in, in terms of touch and olfaction and, and gaze into one another's eyes and things like that. I think our nervous systems need that as fuel to operate optimally. And a lot of that's being taken away. And also, you know, screens, if you're sitting inside, you know, looking at a screen, well, then you're not outside exercising, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you're not sleeping either if you're looking at a screen. So those kind of things worry me a little bit, but, but social media and, and, and virtual meetings, you know, they can, they can connect people and, and offset some of that risk. Well, you're obviously focused on a, a very dark um, and, and, and very sad topic. You also have this strain of sort of optimism that, that keeps coming through and, and hope. So I, I have to ask, how do you maintain that, that sense of optimism and, and hope when you're working on, on such a dark topic? How do you not let the darkness um, consume you? And, and how do you advise your students to be able to do the, the same thing? I mean, I think it's important to be clear-eyed about the reality is very dark. It really is. Um, and, and if people try to deny that reality or, or, deny, or defend, psychologically defend against it, I, I think that's a mistake because it's a stark truth. Nevertheless, to me, that makes progress all the more inspiring. Um, like any bit of progress, any bit of new knowledge, any bit, any bit of practical wisdom, clinical wisdom on something this dark, to me is particularly rewarding. Um, that, that's what I tell my students is that as long as you're feeling somewhat efficacious in dealing with the problem, even if it's like bits and pieces of the problem, then the problem doesn't matter in terms of how dark and huge it is. It's still not going to burn you out and lead to, you know, a sense of despair or, or, or hopelessness or wanting to give up. Um, you know, so for me, I, I think we need people to look at dark things to, so as to fix them, um, else they'll just get worse. A lot of researchers are hesitant to interact with the public or to discuss their, their research with the popular media, but you've taken a different approach. Um, you've had lots of appearances in, in popular, popular media, including radio, print, television. I, I believe you are on the Dr. Phil show. So can you talk to me a little bit about um, what it means to you to, to communicate with the public and, and how do you do so in, in ways that you feel are, are responsible? Well, I mean, I, I understand that that's not everybody's cup of tea or, or you know, strong suit or preference. I, I, I totally understand that. At the same time, there is a role for it, a need for it. Um, and, and I'm not a big fan of the, the sort of view of professors as, you know, made out of spun glass where they can't talk to, you know, people on Dr. Phil or, or whatever. I don't share that view um, at all. 
Dr. Phil is a good example. I mean, people in, in our field, you know, I think pretty much all of them would be very contemptuous or, or dismissive of something like that. And I just think that was very wrong headed where just from that first appearance alone, for instance, the awareness and the um, activity to the national um, hotline triple on that one day, just simply due to my being on Dr. Phil for whatever, 15 minutes. You know, I, I, all the other stuff, don't, don't, that doesn't matter to me compared to something like that. Thinking about the negative emotions that typically accompany uh, suicidal ideation and, and behavior, so I'm thinking about things like hopelessness, despair, do you think that it makes sense to consider ways to eliminate those, those negative emotions or rather just find different ways of managing them? So do they have an, an adaptive purpose? Uh, I think there's, there's a role for both of those. Um, I, I, do, I, I, I do think there is a tendency among deeply suicidal people um, toward, you know, toward misperception of, of, of things, of the state of the world, of their own status, of others' attitudes towards them, things like that, um, the future. And, and so getting those perceptions, you know, just a little more realistic. Not in a Pollyannish way, you know, everything's happy all of a sudden. Not, that's not the point at all. It's more a real reality way. And if reality's not happy, well, at least let's see it for what it is so that we can understand it and maybe do something about it. That, that's kind of my, my take on, on, on that. But negative emotion, you know, it's kind of wired into us. It's there for a reason. It can be adaptive. It can be sending us a, a message or a signal that something needs to be attended to or changed. So I, I don't think there's a need to totally extinguish those things. I think that's an unrealistic thing anyway. Um, so a mixture, I think, of, of making sure perceptions, thoughts are, are roughly in accord with social reality on the one hand. And then, yeah, learning to accept, manage, tolerate, um, channel emotions in ways that are that are productive or at least not harmful to what the person wants, values, you know, desires for him or, or her or, or themselves or for their loved ones. For anyone watching this who might be having some suicidal thoughts or questions, what types of resources are available to them? You know, for anyone in that boat, first and foremost, I have a lot of sympathy and understanding and also hope that this dark time isn't permanent. There are things to do to, to, to lessen the darkness of it um, and sometimes eliminate the darkness of it totally. I'm talking about talking to a primary care physician, for instance, about it or clergy or both. For starters, there's of course mental mental health professionals to access. Though we in the U.S. need to do better about that access and making sure that access is available and 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 high quality, especially. Uh, we have a long way to go on that front. But then there are a lot of other resources available too. Um, turns out that just yesterday I th was the, um, the the national suicide. Um, hotline number legislation has been signed into law uh, by the president. This happened yesterday. And what it's going to do is in about two years, take the current number, which is an 800 number, and, and we should get that number out there too. It's 800-273-TALK, which is 1-800-273-8255-TALK on the, you know, alphabetized dialing system, that number in two years is going to translate into a three-digit code, kind of like 911, but this one's going to be 988. Uh, president signed that into law yesterday um, as we speak here in mid-October of 2020. So, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff is available. People should, should re you know, reach out and use those. CrisisTextLine.org 
is another thing in case you don't want to pick up a phone or reach out and tell you know a, a primary care physician or, or a person in the clergy well either dial 800-273-TALK or text crisis text line.org um, and they'll they'll do crisis counseling via text um, 800-273-TALK if you google that all sorts of very useful resources will will come up resources are all over the internet that's not the problem the problem is are there good quality resources on the internet and that's that's a question mark but if you go to a place like 1-800-273-TALK the quality will be guaranteed thank you so much for sharing that that information and and for sharing your your time and and your experiences with me today i really appreciate it i appreciate your kind interest thank you